This is today. We practice the habit of producing joy. Everybody say, we produce joy. This is the biggest tell. You know what a tell is? A tell is um, like, it, like in poker or in business when, when you're across the table from somebody and they're bluffing. They have a tell. Here, here's a tell. They say, I raise you 500 shibats, whatever that is. And, and, and they go, that's a tell. Now, a lot of them are more subtle than that. Well, I, 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 ha- I know a certain person that every time they lie, they're looking at me and they're talking. And then when they say, when they lie, they say, they say, well, you know, I was at this house the other day. They talk through the back of their eyelids. That's a tell. The biggest tell to the world and to God and to the demonic realm of whether or not you are an overcoming follower of Christ is your joy level. If we don't have joy, we're not living an overcoming life. Now, I want you to notice that the, what I said here is, is the ninth habit isn't that we have joy. What's the ninth habit? We produce joy. Sometimes you got to put it on until it's there. I'm not saying you fake it. No, you act as if the thing that is happening that is not that is not comfortable, that is not what you want, you act as if it won't have the effect it looks in the natural that it will. You act as if there's something on the other side of the trial that's good. You act as if the, 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 the thing that you're going through isn't as, isn't as big as the reward that's on the other side. That the storm isn't as dangerous as, as the safe haven you're heading to. That, that the promise that God gave you is big, is real, and is, it just makes the thing you're going through diminish to the point you don't even consider it. We produce joy. It is a process. All right. The word joy in the Hebrew is is simha. It it frequently occurs in in the Bible, and it means an exceeding gladness of rejoicing. What what is joy? Well, in in Hebrew, it's it's exceeding gladness, and there's a process. You're rejoicing. There's an action. You're rejoicing. This is kind of a a fun fact, okay? In Jewish culture, significant events like childbirth or weddings are generally called simha, joy. A kid is born, let's celebrate, it's joy. Come Come to the joy party. What 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 are we what are we what are we rejoicing about? We had a child. Come to the joy part. Well, what are we rejo- Come to Simha. What, 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 are you, what are we rejoicing about? We just got married. Come, come to Simha. What, what, are, what are we rejoicing? That my lost son came home. That I, that I, found, I found my lost penny. Come, Simha. Do you have joy in your life? Do you look for reasons to celebrate? Most people look for reasons to drink. Most people look for reasons to sin. Most people look for reasons to tell you why they are not where they think they should be. But if you're practicing simha, the Jewish word for joy, you are looking for reasons to celebrate. You're looking for reasons to celebrate. I can bend over and pick it up. Thank you, God. I'm going to learn something through this trial. Well, I don't. I, this is a tough one, but you know, when I get to the other side, I, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to see things different. I'm going to see things differently than I ever have before. We look for reasons to celebrate joy in the Greek. 
is the word kara. And it also means to rejoice. Same word, rejoice or joy. Joy in the New Testament is an inner gladness, it's a deep-seated pleasure. It is a deep assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart. It is a cheerful heart that leads to, listen to me, it doesn't stop in the heart. It leads to a cheerful behavior. It's a cheerful heart, something that's deep in there, that is going to lead to a cheerful behavior. Romans chapter 14, verse 7 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but it is of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's deep within you. If you're born of Christ, then joy is in you. Depending on what you think about, depending what lenses you perceive the world through, that you're looking at the world through, that's going to depend whether or not it comes out of you. I mean, if you were raised in church, there was a song that we sang when we were kids, and a lot, my kids even sang it. It says, it says uh, I've got the, come on, help me, joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart. Down in my heart, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And that's the problem with most Christians. It's in their heart and it stays there. Oh, pastor, God's going to judge me by my heart. Sweet pea, you are unlearned. He knows your heart. He's going to judge you by your actions. You're not going to get to heaven because your heart is right. You're going to get to heaven because what is in your heart is producing a change in your life. God knows what's in your heart. As a matter of fact, the only time the Bible talks about God judging you by your heart is when he's judging evil things that are in your heart. The good things have to be expressed. Joy isn't complete. Joy isn't divine. Joy doesn't. Joy is not something from heaven unless it comes out of you and is expressed. Now, I would go toe to toe with any of you. To, to, any of you say, "Well, I just can't do that. It's not my nature." Oh, if you if you if you knew where I came from, I I was forty years old before I learned how to smile. I'm serious. I grew up with really bad, gnarly teeth, for one. But then again, I also, I also like uh, the serious look. I didn't, want, I didn't want to look weak. And I remember, uh, Nietzsche and I had been married for uh, six years, seven years. And I, I said, oh, my gosh, I, I got to start smiling. People, people think I'm mad. I met my coach. Uh, I, I, met, I met Pastor Tom Mullins 13, 14 years ago, and we were having a conversation. He said, Kenny, I need to ask you something. I, I said, what? He says, are you angry? I said, I'm not angry. Why do you think I'm angry? <laughs> when I preached, I didn't smile. And when you preach and you don't smile, or when you teach and you don't smile, it makes it hard for somebody to want to receive because they think that you're, going, you're, going, you're out for them. So by the way, if I'm smiling big, it's because I dropped, I dropped a big one. I said something that's kind of hard to handle, something that's kind of tough. Joy unexpressed is incomplete. A joyless Christian has joy within their spirit, joy within their heart, but they're not speaking it. They're not engaging it. What does that mean? They're not celebrating anything. I was, I was talking to somebody this week, and, I, and, and, and just because I'm saying this, I want you to know I'm not talking about you, but it's apropos. It means it fits. I'm going to set my thermostat of what I say and what I do to the highest setting of joy that I can. If I don't set my thermostat... To, to where I want to be, then I am simply going to be a thermometer. 
And I am going to report to you how things are going. Report to you how I feel. Report to you the facts of the situation. Most of the body of Christ is operating as a, there we're operating as a thermometer, but God created this, recreated this in Christ Jesus so we could be thermostats, so we could change the environment around us, not report on what it is. Every buck, wild, stupid heathen can do that. If you want to be a, just, just read the paper and then start repeating it. I don't know about you, but I see some wonderful things coming up. I see that, 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 that maybe the devil is at work trying to destroy things, but God always has a way of moving through. I, I know that the economy is going to get tighter, but when the economy gets tighter, that's when the righteous takes more ground. That's when favor really begins to work. That's when increase comes. Listen, if, but if you speak like the world, you're going to go down with the world. I see right now, people say, oh, technology is so terrible. It's just corrupting these kids. Yeah, but did you know we're reaching 500,000 between the ages of 18 and 34 every single week around the world because of this technology? And kids are giving their lives to Jesus all around the world every single day. How's that possible? Because of technology. I celebrate it, man. I know it comes with some problems. I know it comes with some challenges. The same challenges that we had before, they're just a little easier to access now. My kids don't struggle with anything that I didn't struggle with. They just have a, a, a great big huge access to it. But let's take that thing and turn it around for the kingdom of God and be missional with it. Come on, let's serve somebody with that technology. Let's help somebody. Let's lead them to Jesus. Let's get them full of the Holy Spirit. Let's train them. I, I see some good things coming. Yes, technology is going to increase. You know, they'll probably be able just to, they can do it right now. You got your phone on and they can be watching you and recording you. Google can. It's illegal, but they can do it. But you know what else is coming? Because technology has advanced that far, we could, in a couple years, be talking to 20, 30, 40 different nations, have a, a Zoom meeting going on, and, and we could be talking in our language. They could be sharing, communicating in their language, but we won't know the difference because it will interpret it for us through an AI system. Language will become something we could easily breakthrough where right now it's one of the strongest barriers that it has existed since Babylon in declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation. You see, we celebrate. Joy celebrates. Joy, we set our thermometer, we set our thermostat, we take our thermometer and maybe we... And, and we put it up here and say, no, you know, when I walk into a room, I want people to feel God. When I walk into a room, I, I, I want to bring in the presence of, of God. I want to bring in joy. I want to bring in strength. I want to bring in peace. I don't, I don't want to tell you how bad things are getting. Because, listen, things are bad everywhere for everybody, and they get, they get worse the more you talk about them. An old lady... Um, during the holiness movement, I mean, old, old lady, old rocker chair lady, one of the young ones came up to her and said, how come your faith is so strong? How come things go so well in your life? And she said, well, you youngins talk about all your problems and how strong the devil is, and he just gets bigger and bigger in your life. He says, she said, I talk about my God. And the more I talk about my God and the promises of God, the smaller my problems get. See, but you can't do that if you don't practice producing joy. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says, May God, the God of hope, fill you with all joy, peace, as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see the connection here. If God fills you with joy, you're going to have peace, and that will help produce what? Hope. Don't ever underestimate divine hope. 
Natural hope says, well, I don't know what God will do. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, but we're hoping for the best. Divine hope says, this is the promise of God. It is a sure. It's going to happen. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. I don't know how, but it's going to happen. I don't know where the, where the favor is right now, but when, when we get into this situation, the favor of God's going to bust this thing wide open. I don't know where it is right now, but the anointing of God has promised that he's going to break this yoke. I don't know where the provision is, but God promised that we would live an abundant and overflowing life. So it's coming. I believe that that's, that's, that's celebrating. That's hope. See, joy produces hope, hope strengthens faith, and faith receives from God. So if you don't have joy, you won't have hope. And if you don't have hope, your faith can be really, really weak, and it'll make it difficult for you to receive what God has for you. Did I say that too fast? Y'all are looking at me like, Bleh. did I say it too fast? If you don't have joy, if you can't see the world through the lenses of Jesus' promises, if, if, you, can't, if you don't have joy, you're not going to see a future that is good. God says, I know the plans for you. But you have hope and a future. I, I don't have plans to hurt you, but I have plans to, to make things go well and to prosper you. See, see that, that creates a, a future in, in my, my mind's eye. I see that God is what? That his word is true? That he's working behind the scenes in all things, all things, whether good or bad, God will turn it around to work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's what the word of God says. So I know this sucks right now. I, know, I don't understand it. But I do know that God is going to turn this thing around and he's going to make something better out of it than if it had never happened. I believe the word of God over my circumstances over my situation, over my feelings, and I'm going to make my, I'm going to bridle my tongue, and I'm going to talk with hope. I'm going to talk with joy, and I'm going to talk with faith, because that's how I receive from God. My attitude is, my atmosphere of my heart is transformed when I do that, and then I may have this ability to thank God for something that I don't have yet. That's how I receive. If you had to wait till you receive before you're full of joy and hope and thankfulness, um, you're a thermometer. You're a reporter. So let me help you balance or reconcile this with what, what, what we call facts in the world. This is what I see. And if I leave it at that, this is what's happening. This is how I feel. And if I leave it at that, I'm not grabbing a hold of the promises of God. So I have to look at these things through the promises of God. And I say, well, this may be happening, but the word of God says, so therefore it's going to be better. I have to tag it with the promises of God. Because your tongue is the rudder of your life and, and, and the issues of life and death are established by what you say. You're going to get what you say. You better watch what you say. Put God's word, God's promises, infuse them with your problems. Infuse them with the struggles. Infuse them with the trials and the tribulation. And you're going to see the promises of God because that will produce hope. And when you have that hope, your faith is strengthened. And your ability to receive from God increases. You know, that's good stuff. Joy produces hope. What does joy produce? It produces light in the darkness. It produces order out of chaos. It, 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 it confuses, it, it, it produces a way in the confusion. Joy produces safety in peril. Joy produces calm in the storm. Joy produces understanding in the confusion. Joy produces patience in the pressure. Joy produces hope in the hopeless, strength for the weak, order in the chaos, calmness in the turmoil, and confidence in the insecurity. 
joy. And joy is seeing things through the eyes of Jesus. We're seeing through spiritual eyes. James just has produced, we practice producing joy by making sure we got the right lenses on. James chapter 1 verse 2 tells you how to do it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials and tribulations of many kind. Don't consider the problem. The more you think about the problem, like, like the little old holy lady said, the more you think about it, the bigger your problem's going to get. It says, consider it pure joy. Okay, this, 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 this hurts. Uh, this is what all the experts are saying. This is what looks like what's coming. But I see God moving. I see, I see God acting. I see, I see God turning things around. Now that is joy. I consider it what? I consider it. Let me, let me find a way to say this. I consider the circumstances and this situation and this thing that I don't like, this trial, this tribulation, this temptation. I, I consider this a catalyst to move the hand of God in my life. I, I consider this thing that I'm going through an avenue by which God can get greater access into my life. I'm not telling you to dismiss the thing. I'm not going to dismiss a wild, growly uh, pit bull that's standing right there. Oh, praise God, there's a pit bull. And let him tear me up. I'm going to say, well, by Jesus' stripes, I, I'm healed. I got the protection of the Lord. Now, you just, and I've done this before. You'd be silent in the name of Jesus. I'll be honest with you, if they're not silent and they come after me, they're going down. But I know it's God's strength that will help me put him down. Do you see the difference? And you want to know, I, I can tell you because of the way I've trained my mind. You know what's great about that circumstance and situation? If I had to put him down with my bare hands, I'll never fear a dog again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Well, I guess if I had to take him down, God would give me the strength. He did it. Hey, did he do it for David? He tore up a lion and a bear with his bare hands. Did he do it for Samson? Yeah, Samson did the same thing. Would he do it for me? Well, he doesn't show favoritism. So I guess if I had to, and then that experience would create something in me that would be permanent, which would be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fear wild animals anymore. I wouldn't fear an attack by a dog anymore. Praise the Lord. Where's that pit bull? You see the difference? I, I hear a dog barking. I'm running to it. Because this is going to be an opportunity. Come on. This, is going to be, this might be an opportunity for me to get rid of this fear. Do you see the difference? Well, you better, leery, be, better be leery. You better, be, better stay away. Well, you know, that depends on how many times that you have considered it pure joy. What, what's so good about this because it hurts? What's so good about this because I don't have enough? What's so good about this because I'm hungry? What's so good about this because I'm confused? You know what's good about it? When you go through this again, you're going to sail through it instead of stumbling and stopping and pausing because it will develop your faith. Joy precedes the experience. 1 Peter 1 8 says, Though you have not seen him, speaking of Christ, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Because you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. 
We want to celebrate when we receive the salvation of our soul. And that's going to be when Jesus comes and takes us home or when we, when we decide to leave this place and go to that place. But we rejoice now. Why? Because he said it. He don't lie. I, I like to say, he says what he means and he means what he says. If he says he's going to save my soul, then I'm going to rejoice. And, and guess what happens? The experience of rejoicing produces the emotions and the feelings and the spiritual confidence that actually walking up and getting it from Jesus does. That's how faith works. Joy sees through the struggle. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 20, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. Ouch. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that her child is born into the world. I watched her go through this. <laughs> several times. She knew what was coming. But she'd get excited. Because she knew the baby was going to be there. She knew how painful it was going to be. And she didn't, she didn't, Pastor Nija didn't take any pain medication at all with all the childbirths she did. And that wasn't because of a doctrinal belief. It's just the way, she, you know, it's what her convictions were. She went through 100% of the pain with joy. Now, I'm not saying she didn't, she didn't hit me and things like that during childbirth, but I learned to stay on the other, way back over here. And, How you doing, honey? But we went to the hospital with joy. Every time. Because it sees the thing on the other side is the joy, the joy, the contentment, the happiness, the, the peace, the fulfillment that is on the other side of this, the, those emotions, those feelings, far exceed the pain and the suffering that I'm going through right now. And I've been through this with God so many times that I know it's true, and you do too. You talk about your problems and your problems get bigger. You talk about your God and your problems get smaller. That's what rejoicing is. That's what having an attitude of gratitude is. Thankfulness and joy walk together. See, 1 Peter 1, 4 says that God's divine power and the knowledge of God in his divine power, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. So that through these promises, we may participate in God's divine nature. you got God's divine nature in you. you got his spirit in you. you got his power in you. You have his ability in you. You, you have his faith in you. You have, you have his love in you. Are you listening to me? You're not waiting for God's divine power. You have it. You're a walking container of God's divine power. You are a walk, you are a tabernacle of God. God's spirit is within you. The Bible says, don't you know that your body is a temple and that God's spirit lives in you? You are a walking, a walking, talking wineskin full of the new wine, which is the anointing and the power of God. You may not feel it. You know why? Because you're not tapping into the promises. We participate in God's divine nature. You're not waiting to get it. It's in you. You participate in his divine nature through the promises of God. Although he knew no sin, he was made to be sin so we might become the very righteousness of God. I don't feel righteous, but he said I am. Thank God I'm the, right, I'm the righteousness of God. By his stripes I have been healed. Man, I don't feel good, but I know that God is going to release that healing power that is within me. Because if his spirit lives within me, the Bible says, he will strengthen my mortal body. I, I know that God's favor goes before me because the word says so. He, he, the glory of the Lord is my rear guard. The Bible tells me that I have two warring angels, one on the right and one on the left, that is protecting me and, and keeping me from stumbling if I, just, if I just stay close to him. Are you hearing me? What can man do to me when God is 
on my side. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. These are the promises of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. These are the promises of God. If I'm going to participate in the ability and the power that is within me, that Jesus died on that cross, suffered in, in the pits of hell, so that we could have, I have got to spend time, number one, the Word of God is first in my life, because through them I discover and have knowledge of His promises. Don't think... And I'm trying to communicate to you that you won't struggle with belief, faith, anxiousness, nervousness, maybe even depression. You, you may have the struggles of that, but God will not abandon you and he'll take you through. I'm not talking about living a life of perfection where I never have temptation. You're going to have to, if you're going to grow, you're going to have temptation. If you're going to grow, you're going to go through trials. If you're going to grow, you're going to go through tribulations. If you're going to grow, sometimes it's just not going to look like God is moving at all, but he is. So I need to tap into that divine nature. I need to start speaking to myself and people around me the promises of God. I speak about the promises of God as, as if I've already received them. How many of you say that you're saved? Can I see your hands, please? Mm -hmm. But you're not completely there yet. We're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But hold on, I'm saved. Why? Because I got the promise. And I'm not going to give up on the promise. I'm not giving up on the promise. I'm, I'm going to go through hell and high water. I'm going to get there. I know that this life is full of storms, but I'm going to get to the safe haven on the other side. I know that there's, there's troubles coming, but you know what? God is going to be with me through those troubles, and he's going to cause those troubles to cause somehow increased and betterment and the blessing to come into my life. I, Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, if you believe that you received when you pray, then... You'll have what you ask for. How can I, how can I have, believe that I've got it when I don't have it? How can I thank him for something I don't have yet? You want to know when, you know, when, when you're operating in that? Because joy comes easy. I've got it. Because I know the character of my God and the nature of my God. When I ask, his answer is yes and amen to the promises. I'm so confident because of what I've seen him do in my past. And I know he's not going to change. And he'll do the same in my future. Now what's the thing in the past that oh, I always struggled with? Not knowing when. And when I become comfortable with God's timing instead of my time. The distance between the amen and the receiving. When I become comfortable with that, because I believe that he will do what he said, then his divine nature begins to strengthen me. And I can see a future by the Holy Spirit that is so much better than I could have ever asked, thought, or imagined. And I grab a hold and I say, yes, I, I don't, I'm better than I thought. Let's do that. Yeah, let's go for that. Thank you. Oh, here it comes. Thank you. Oh, praise Jesus. Oh, God. God's going to do something good. That's joy. Come on. God's going to do something good. That's when I know I've got it. We produce joy. Joy sees through the... I'm sorry, I'm going long, but joy sees through the eyes of the Spirit. The Spirit sees through the eyes of the promise. Joy sees through the danger and sees angels of protection. Joy sees through the sickness and disease and, and sees healing and restoration. Joy sees through the crooks and the thieves and, and sees a coming recompense. 
Joy sees through the strife and the disagreement to a whole and a healthy relationship. Joy sees through the recession and sees great opportunities. Joy sees through the downturn in the economy and sees an increase in prosperity. Joy sees through the struggle and sees an inward strength from our creator. Joy sees through the pain and it sees wholeness and contentment. Joy sees through the gossip and slander and sees the favor of God. Joy sees through the weakness and sees divine strength. Joy sees through the valleys and it sees the mountaintops. Joy sees through the darkness and it sees light. Joy sees through the loneliness and it sees that you're never alone. Joy sees through the failure and it sees a new beginning. See, when we produce joy, it creates something in our life but he creates something for those around us. It creates direction for the lost, healing for the sick, comfort for those in pain, a beacon in the fog, life for the dying, resurrection for the dead, answers for the question, provision for the poor. It produces hospitality for the foreigner, Acceptance for the rejected, clarity for the perplexed, confirmation for the decision, help for the helpless, direction for the lost, clear sight through the vague, confidence for the doubting, instruction for the dumbfounded, rest for the weary, and peace for those at war. See, joy sees the eternal, joy sees love, joy sees peace, joy sees provision, joy sees protection, joy, joy sees a divine purpose, joy sees a breakthrough, joy sees a miracle, joy sees forgiveness, joy sees acceptance, joy sees a transformation, joy sees a spiritual father, joy sees a blessed life, joy sees a home. In heaven. We practice producing joy. If we're going to be an overcoming follower of Christ, we practice the habit of keeping God's word first. We practice the habit of continual prayer. We practice the habit of self-examination by considering our ways. We practice the habit of being missional. We practice the habit of being generous. We practice the habit of attending and participating in our church community. We practice the habit of serving. We practice the habit of gratitude. And we pra practice the habit of producing joy. Would you bow your head with me? Father, we just thank you for this message. Cause this message, Lord, to produce something in our heart, a vision for our future. Lead us and guide us through this week as we attempt to practice producing joy. Focusing on your promises, rejoicing and celebrating whenever possible. Lord, we love you and we praise you with your.